Well, good afternoon, good afternoon. It's great to see you. Hi, I'm Dan Stein, and thank you for joining me. Give a few folks a couple of minutes to come on in here, having a cup of coffee on Fair's Build the Wall mug. And I got to tell you, this is one of the biggest sellers we've ever had here. They're flying off the shelves. And in fact, I'm not sure we have any more left. But the good news is we're going to have some others that will be coming online shortly. And you'll have your opportunity to select from a variety of mugs that have many of the same features. Build the wall, make it tall, because as you can see, there's a lot of work left to be done on the immigration issue. Now... Uh, this is FAIR's 40th anniversary. 40th anniversary, 1979 was the year that we were founded. And so here we are 40 years later, and I'm thinking back on the day I walked into the organization. I've been with FAIR off and on in various capacities now for 37 of those 40 years. So I have a lot to report on. I've seen a lot over the years. The organization that I walked into in 1982 was a small group of people in a townhouse near DuPont Circle here in Washington. Wonderful, wonderful group of people. We had an executive director. His name was Roger Connor. Uh, definitely running on a shoestring. The most remarkable thing about FAIR when I came in here was that it was made up of concerned American citizens. Many of them had come from other parts of the country to work to try to pass reasonable immigration levels of legislation to try to implement some of the key recommendations of a major commission that had come out with a report in the 1979 period, the Hesburgh Commission it was called. What was really remarkable about that was that there was this naivete, if you will. People really believed that it was a matter of simply coming into Congress and telling them in terms so plain and clear uh, as to command their assent data-based analysis that unless we brought immigration levels under control and restructured the current process for selecting immigrants, we would continue to see growth as far as the eye could see. Now, many of those folks discovered the hard way that there are, in fact, a lot of forces in this country that are working very hard to deconstruct the United States as a nation state, as an independent sovereign, and it begins with the loss of our ability to control our borders and regulate them. A lot of those interests were powerful back then, but a lot of them were not. And over the intervening 40 years, we've seen a tremendous growth in the organizations that are working to try to tear down the nation's immigration enforcement apparatus. But in 1982, we were very optimistic that we were going to see major reforms. And by the time the 1986 immigration legislation came to the floor, it was very clear that there was opposition to changing the selection criteria. And although employer sanctions were finally enacted after the first time they were introduced was like 1948, Peter Rodino, remember him, a member of Congress from New Jersey, his first term, he introduced an employer sanctions bill and it took from 1948, we got the Texas proviso in there in 1952, that exempted employment from harboring sanctions. Uh, then we had the termination of the Bracero program in 1964. Of course, we had then hemisphere quotas put in in 1965. We saw an increase in illegal immigration by 1968, 69. By the mid-70s, that's why the Hesburgh Commission was, was appointed. Finally, in 1986, Congress found in its wisdom that it was okay to pass a law that said employers have to hire authorized workers, not illegal aliens, authorized workers, which included, of course, uh, non-immigrant aliens who were in the U.S. who were not work authorized. We had great expectations, of course, after 1986 that they were going to enforce those laws. And as everybody knows, and part of the reason why the immigration issue is now so polarized, is that business community, the business organizations, along with the Ford Foundation and others on the left-wing side of things, worked very hard to try to thwart enforcement and make it very difficult to enforce those laws. Uh, after the 1993 Trade Center bombing, that was the first Trade Center bombing where it was clear that the people here were illegally here. Many of them had come in with phony asylum claims, overstayed visas, uh, using documents, illegal documents, fraudulent documents. There was a push to try to tighten up asylum in the early 1990s. There was a major grassroots push in 1994, which led to California's enacting Proposition 187. And, of course, consistently since then, every time voters have had a choice, with very few exceptions, they voted in favor of strong immigration controls. Those of us who worked on the issue in 1982 were not really fully aware of how the divisions within our society between the very elite who make money off immigration 
and the average American would become such a divisive division. Uh, but we now see this taking hold in this country far more aggressively than we ever would have imagined back then. Another effort was made with a commission in 1995. Barbara Jordan, the esteemed stateswoman, a member of Congress who chaired this commission, uh, also implemented or initiated and recommended some laws that we firmly supported and thought would ultimately make it into law. Many of those recommendations did get into law in 1996, but the major ones changing again, the immigration criteria and putting a cap on overall immigration did not survive because of an alliance between the business community and the left wing and some of the religious organizations. Uh, 2001 happened. We all know what happened on 9-11-2001. Catastrophic terrorist attack, again, by people who were abusing the immigration system, who lied their way in, who overstayed visas, used fraudulent driver's licenses. I remember very distinctly. I can remember it as clear as a bell, coming into work that morning, watching the television, I was thinking, well, finally, people are going to recognize that organizations like the ACLU and others have no standing any longer to attack U.S. immigration controls. That clearly the debate will be forever changed, and no longer will we see an effort to try to give fraudulent, uh, try to give documents like driver's licenses to those here illegally or people who are in a temporary status. We would certainly begin to see the welding of state and local and federal controls in immigration enforcement, and we would once again see a unified nation in how we enforce the law. And there was progress that was made fairly consistently, not great progress, but fairly consistent progress, 2002 to about 2007. Lo and behold, even though he didn't campaign on the issue that much, Barack Obama came in and he said, uh, okay, I got a different idea. We're going to dismantle enforcement and we're going to uh, change the Democratic Party view of how immigration works. Those of us who came in in 1982 or 1979 could never have foreseen the change in the Democratic Party. I mean, I remember distinctly how the Democratic Party always stood for protecting American labor and ensuring that immigration controls were enforced to, to, to level the playing field for American workers to make sure that the, the most vulnerable Americans had the bargaining leverage to achieve the American dream. Somehow, in the face of what's happened in the last 30 years, income disparities increasing, gap between African American and, and white, Wage rates have begun to grow again. We see great income differential. We see increase in poverty. And, and most importantly, we see aggregate wage stagnation in ways that seem to undercut so much of what the Democratic Party said it stood for. There's no question that the immigration laws of this country and our failure to enforce them has been a major factor in what's happened to, to wages in this country. There are other factors too, of course, but it's one of the major factors. If you can't you cannot ignore the dramatic supply, increase in the supply of labor that immigration has brought about. This kind of common sense thinking seems to have now evaporated from the Democratic Party side, in part because of the voting patterns of the immigrants themselves. And the total corruption has now taken hold. Between 2008 and today, we now see a different Democratic Party. Forty years later, after our founding, we're taking a look to, at, a, at a scenario where we see a division of, of viewpoints that is tearing this country apart. None of us could ever have imagined that immigration policy would have been the, the issue on which the core of the fabric, the woof, wool and woof, woof and warp, there we go, of the fabric would be torn asunder, and yet that does seem to be the case. Now it's controversial to actually control our borders. Now it's controversial to construct a physical barrier when, 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 as late as 2008, both parties with bipartisan support funded the construction of these kinds of barriers. All of a sudden we see now an overt effort in states like California and New York to reward illegal immigration, to incentivize it, to encourage it, to use taxpayer funding to assist in it. We see the federal government, we see anti-trafficking laws, courtesy of people like then Senator Biden and Senator Feinstein that actually facilitate alien smuggling. And we see this effort to encourage alien smuggling and reward it and, and encourage illegal immigration taking place as recently as the last few weeks during the, uh, in the, la the last budget battle that took place just a few weeks ago. 
In many ways, the need for fear is stronger than ever. Yes, we have many accomplishments under our belt. I don't think there's any question that without fear, and a couple of our allied organizations, like our Immigration Reform Law Institute, which is an affiliate of FAIRS, there would not be the kind of responsible voice holding the line against these very powerful interests that are trying to deconstruct and dismantle everything that, that uh, we believe the United States needs to have if we're going to control our destiny and ensure our national self-determination. Immigration policy touches on virtually every aspect of American society on education, on housing, on con traffic congestion, our infrastructure, on our environment, our natural environment, on water tables, on their ability to set aside wildlife as areas and, and wildlife preservation, wilderness preservation. Everything is implicated one way or another. Our national cultural co cohesion, uh, our ability to retain an historical, a common historical memory as we walk together into the future. These divisions seem to be growing up around the idea of the role of immigration in the United States in the 21st century. Never before has this kind of voice been needed. Never before has there been an effort by what used to be the mainstream media to exclude rational voices on this issue. Immigration is now at the top of the tipple, as they say, for, for many of the, uh, for, certainly for the Republican Party, many independent voters. We see this in Europe, by the way, too, exact same phenomenon. And certainly it's an issue for Democratic voters, and where they stand is somewhat hard to say, because look, do you believe polls? Like, I don't believe polls. Some polls are good, some polls are bad, but we get all these polls. Let me tell you, a lot of these polls are not worth the paper they're written on. They're push polls. You know, one of the characteristics of the modern debate, when you have such enormous interest in the topic, is that there are so many people commenting on and writing about the immigration issue who seem to know nothing about it, who know nothing about how it works. You continue to have divisions within the Republican Party, the business wing, the Koch network, and funded, uh, very elaborately funded organizations that, that produce op-eds, that produce phony studies, these experts, if you will, who can create uh, misleading studies for the American people to see they're all over the place, and they're well-funded. Standing in opposition to this well-funded business wing, libertarian, if you will, low, low labor costs, cheap labor agenda, are a few organizations like FAIR that represent the average American's point of view. What FAIR does is marry your activism with our expertise to make all of us as effective as possible in a partnership that we think has worked very well for 40 years and hope you believe will, should continue. We celebrate our 40th anniversary during a time when there's an ongoing border crisis going on. Now, do you believe there's a border crisis? I believe there's a border crisis. Even though the number of numerical apprehensions may be lower than they were in the early 2000s, there is a bona fide border crisis. Because as everybody knows, Border Patrol is having a difficult time apprehending people in part because of the way in which the law is being interpreted and enforcement policy changes that were made during the Obama administration. We also know that the asylum laws are being dramatically abused, and one of the reasons why we see a change in the demographics, women and children showing up at the border instead of young men, is because of policy changes that began primarily during the Obama administration and now carried forward as the Trump administration tries to contend with it. We do know that there's a bona fide crisis. Just last week, head of the Border Patrol, Carla Provost, she broke down in tears describing the tragedy of what's happening on our border. A true humanitarian crisis of our own making because of policies that send the wrong signal throughout Central America that if you get here and turn yourself in, you will get a work document and a get out of jail free card for years. Immigration case law backlogs in our court system has reached close to a million. It's now years before an alien gets an asylum hearing. The asylum system that groups on the other side of this issue insisted be set up in the 1980s, what used to be a very simple process before an asylum officer, yes or no, you get asylum, no review, turned into a miniature court system, what's called an Article I administrative court system. All this elaborate notice and comment and trial type hearings and opportunity to bring counsel and what have you, along with these dramatically expanded definitions of what qualifies for political asylum, 
have produced an enormous skyrocketing increase in asylum claims, as well as an inducement because of the delay to make fraudulent asylum claims. Looking at this thing logically, anybody can see what the problem is. The difference today from 40 years ago is there's now one party that will not operate in good faith to actually try to fix these problems as they arise. Now, Carla Provost, who heads the Border Patrol, believes that there's a crisis and believes there's an emergency on the border. The president believes there's an emergency on the border. There's an emergency on the border. And the fact that the Democrats and some Republicans refuse to acknowledge this and give the president the money he needs to do what he needs to do down there on the border is, is, a, is not only a stain on the national character, but sends a message around the world that the United States lacks the self-confidence to actually ensure that its borders are controlled. Illegal immigration is spiking up again anyway, notwithstanding the claims of a deny of a, of a reduced number coming across. And they're spiking in Rio Grande Valley and in other parts of the country. Now, NBC comes out with a report today, earlier today. This is what I'm talking about. This is exactly the kind of stuff I'm talking about. We've always had some media bias. I mean, there's no question about it there's been media bias. I mean, media, nobody's totally objective. Even I'm not totally objective. I know this may be hard to believe, but I've been known to have a point of view. That's okay. It's good to have a point of view. But when you read articles in NBC in particular that you know are fraudulent and completely absurd, NBC has an article today that essentially says, we're responsible for illegal immigration. That the reason there's an increase in people crossing illegally is because we, we won't let everybody come into the country. If we would just let everybody come into the country to make their phony asylum claims, they wouldn't try to cross illegally. That requiring them to stay in Mexico before they make an asylum claim is somehow too onerous for people who claim to be fleeing at the point of a gun and who have everything to fear if they're sent back to their home country. Somehow it's too inconvenient, and so they have to come illegally. Meantime, MS-13 gangs, according to the NYPD in New York, are going to be targeting off-duty law enforcement personnel. And how did MS-13 get into the country? How did it all start? It's very interesting to see this complete disconnect. All right, so this kind of thing is something that, I mean, this kind of media absurdity, ridiculousness, is now something we're treated to every day. So while we've always had bias in the media and people you know, don't expect reporters to be completely objective, they all have a point of view and there's nothing wrong with that. Manifest absurdity has now become the standard in the legacy media on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'm not a complainer. And I do want you to know that there are a lot of good things happening too, okay? Under the administration, this untold story is very important and I want you to pay close attention to what I'm saying. Worksite enforcement is up. Worksite enforcement, these are the enforcement processes for employer sanctions, okay? They're going out and checking out worksites to see uh, whether people are authorized to work on worksites. This is very, very important. In fact, they're up 300% this year in the last 12-month period. So unlike the Obama administration that virtually stopped worksite enforcement, they are really tightening up. There's also been, of course, a major crackdown on foreign labor programs. This is all great news. I mean, this is a tremendous accomplishment. The administration has cracked down on what are called outsourcing firms. They require a lot more evidence before they give an H-1B uh, visa out. The denial rates are up not only for H-1Bs, but for some of these other abused non-immigrant visa programs like the intra-company transferee, the L visa. Not surprisingly, the opposition, the, the groups are squawking, the business groups, the outsourcing firms, Infosys and some of the others that are basically taking our technology and moving it out of the country. They have filed 40 lawsuits, 40 lawsuits, 40 lawsuits in just one district court alone here in the U.S. Court of the District Court of the District of Columbia, 40 different lawsuits. In fact, Every single thing the Trump administration has tried to do in furtherance of the immigration control promises the president made in his campaign has come under repeated legal attack from the ACLU and other organizations. Everything, not just the travel ban, not just defunding sanctuary cities, not just detention policy, not just H-1B workers, for example, but every, every single proposal has been repeatedly attacked in an orchestrated way. This kind of orchestrated political attack has marginalized Congress and made the courts the second most influential component of U.S. immigration policy. 
This is not how it should be in a free democracy. Courts are not given authority to just rewrite the immigration law, but that is in, in effect what they're doing. Temporary protected status is another example. The Trump administration, long overdue effort to try to terminate these TPS grants that were made, that were made years ago. And now they've had to extend TPS to a number of these countries, Haiti, Salvador, and others, uh, again, because of a court injunction while they debate the legality of the issue. This is an overt direct interference with something that has clearly been given to Congress to the president to make a unilateral determination on, and yet it still gets subject to court attack. Forty different lawsuits attacking the H-1B workers, H-1B uh, tightening up. And, um, and of course, they're also going to remove the work eligibility for the spouses of H-1B and H-4 work authorization. This is very important because the original purpose of H-1B was temporary unforeseen labor shortages for emergent conditions while Americans could be trained up. Has now turned into a low-cost tech worker gravy train, the non-tech worker gravy train, and not surprisingly, Americans' participation in the labor force has reached historic lows at a time when we have a very robust economy. Make no mistake about it. FAIR is here every day in Washington, and we see what's going on on the Hill. We know what's going on in the White House. We talk to the folks there. We talk to the folks on the Hill. National Association of Manufacturers, Chamber of Commerce, Dairy Association, Big Agriculture, they're up here every single day, every single day, pressing Republicans in response to what the administration is doing to increase foreign labor programs. They even increased the H-2B program during this last debate over the emergency funding issue. Um, they're doing everything they can to try to prevent the natural wage increases that the Trump administration is entitled to enjoy as a result of this strong, robust economy. Now, do we want to see these wage increases undermined by allowing these organizations to press the administration to support massive increases in, in immigration? Do we want to allow them to get to the Democrats uh, a free pass on the radical and extreme positions they've been taking in this upcoming election if they do that? Some say Jared Kushner is calling the tune on immigration policy in the White House. I refuse to believe that. Obviously, he's involved. I'm not a big fan of nepotism personally, but obviously not everybody feels that way. But only with your support and constant vigilance are we going to try to ensure that the president does not abandon the core principles on which he got elected and turn around and support some kind of massive increase in foreign labor because he would be responding to the pressure, the very pressure that was as a result of his success. Success in tightening up the abuse of these programs, success in generating more jobs in the United States. This is what it's all about. With proper immigration controls, the American standard of living would go up, wages would go up, we would see improvements in public education, we would see improvements in community safety. We would see a, a, a better balance between our infrastructure and the population of the United States. We would be better able to protect our environment. We would give immigrants the time to assimilate and acculturate into the American experiment. And we could make immigration great again by restoring the principle of the rule of law and the rule of law matters. So this is something we can't give up on, even though I know some days it gets discouraged. The Immigration Reform Law Institute just put out a dandy new report, and I hope you've read about it, but it just, it's, it's, it's a tragedy when you think about it. After so many of these angel parents have told you the tragedy of losing loved ones at the hands of people who have no right to be in the country, California, according to the FOIA documents that Early just obtained, refused 5,600 detainer requests in the last 27 months, over a 27-month period. 5,600 detainer requests. That means 5,000 requests by the federal government to hold a criminal alien for removal. Of those 5,600, 3,400 were for class one and two felonies. Okay, we're talking serious offenses, rape, murder, robbery, armed robbery, burglary, serious offenses. California says, we don't care. We're going to just let them go back on the streets. You wonder why people are leaving California. This is a governance. To tell you how bad things have gotten, Bernie Sanders, who's running for president again, I know I hear all the cheers out there. I know how excited all of you are that Bernie Sanders is running again. It certainly makes my heart quicken. The prospect of seeing Bernie out on the hustings again. Who could possibly miss this, the Democratic primaries, right? I mean, 
this will be a circus. Trump will have a very clear channel of communication through this whole process while the Democrats battle it out in the primaries. Anyhow, Bernie Sanders has announced that his spokesper- chief poke spokesperson is here illegally, right? A woman who has DACA, deferred action, right, for childhood arrivals. Her name is Belene Sisa. Now, look, DACA is, is simply a deferred action on removal, right? That doesn't mean you're legally here. It means the government has said they're not taking action on your removability right now. Now, she has work authorization under that status, but, it, but it's about as illegal as you can get and still be illegal. So you're illegal, but you're kind of legal, but you're not really legal because you really don't have status because there's no legal, there's really no legal authorization, no statutory authorization for you to have the status, right? Trump tried to end it. Again, another court battle. But what does it mean if a presidential contender like that is going to to so arrogantly disregard the rule of law? Why do we have to have a two-class system in this country where one group of people can just ignore the law and say, well, my parents brought me here. I shouldn't have to go back home. Why? Why do I obey the law? Why do you obey the law? Why do some of us work so hard to respect U.S. law? Isn't respect for law a cornerstone of citizenship? It used to be the Immigration and Naturalization Service, right? Immigration was the first step, and then naturalization was the last. During the process, you learned about what it meant to be an American, what it meant to learn civics, to participate as a citizen in a democracy, to vote and participate, but also meant understanding the political philosophy behind our democratic system, which ought to include uh, some some appreciation for the role of capital markets and free and market capitalism in the advance, not only in the U.S., but of the world. The achievements of market capitalism in the last 30 years are historically without precedent. They are a story of great pride for Americans and what we have achieved in sending information and knowledge in advancing education in developing countries. One of the great quandaries for FAIR, we didn't really realize 40 years ago, is that We knew the poorest of the poor around the world did not move. But what we didn't realize is that as standards of living increase in the developing world, people gain not only access to more information and more knowledge through communications, but as their incomes rise, they also gain the ability to get someplace. They don't want to have to stay, so they can go someplace. So as standard of livings increase, people become more mobile and they get the chance to move. That's a huge deal that suddenly we're facing over the next 35 or 40 years this increase in mobility potential. And so if you take a look at the demographic projections for the U.S. or, say, Europe, you can pretty much project the the population growth of the native population based on fertility estimates. The great outlier here is the migration patterns, which can widely vary and which can dramatically change the outcome. Now, people are going to say, well, United States, we need more immigrants because of because we're aging, right? We're getting older. I mean, yeah, okay, I'm not as young as I used to be, but the fact is the society's not aging. I'm aging, maybe. Everybody's aging individually, but we're not aging. Americans are working longer. You ever spend any time in Florida in these resorts? You see people working who are 75 and 80 years old. You increase the retirement age, and you accomplish a lot more than you're ever going to accomplish through immigration because immigrants bring elderly parents. I mean, you, you might modestly change the average age composition of the country. You dramatically increase the dependency of their elderly parents and their children, and they come here. So it's really not a solution to the aging problem that they claim, okay? But it does have a dramatic potential impact on your population growth rates because migration tends to be now very unpredictable. You know, these surges like what we see from Central America, not predicted four or five years ago. Um, Another thing I want to talk about, robots. Robots are dramatically increasing. We've seen like a 37% increase in robots uh, in the last uh, two years. Uh, I think in 2017, 2018, 35,000 robots were purchased in the United States for manufacturing. 35,000. That is going to accelerate very rapidly because robotics are taking hold faster than anybody can imagine. 30, 40 years ago, none of us imagined the impact of outsourcing and the globalization of the economy and the impact of the internet on the changing way in which knowledge work is done. 
And obviously, at the same time, 40 years ago, none of us imagined the threat that robotics meant to the ability of people with less skill and less education who do, did repetitive work and had high standards of living back in the 50s and 60s. What exactly are all these poor and unskilled people who are pouring across our borders going to do when robotics take hold? And if, in fact, wage rates increase, robotics will be adopted even faster. If you want to retard the introduction of technologically advanced robotics, bring in more so-called low-cost labor. Places like Japan are doing very well introducing robotics into their economy, and there's no reason why we can't as well, but we shouldn't be defeating ourselves. By the same token, recognizing the big problem with the Green New Deal. The question is, how does getting us off of carbon emissions, the carbon footprint, changing the way in which we consume power, how is that made easier by expanding our population by millions and millions of people through immigration? The U.S. has a large carbon footprint, not as big as China's, but obviously as population grows, your ability to cut carbon emissions in the aggregate declines, but it doesn't decline, it, it, your ability declines because your population is growing. So that means that you're not getting the same bang for your buck as, as per capita of carbon emissions decline. See what I'm saying? It's very difficult to understand how the modern day environmental community now so embedded in, in the Democratic Party can turn a blind eye to the impl implications of immigration in helping this country achieve uh, conversion to renewable energy over the next hundred years. The administration is working very hard, and we support this, to keep asylum seekers in Mexico. Why? Because everybody knows most of these asylum seekers are, are fraudulent. They're, they're making fraudulent claims. You know, you know it, I know it, you know this is all bogus. You understand why they're doing it, we have this studied air of unreality, this ostrich effect of mostly Democrats in the Congress who refuse to recognize the impact of laws that they've helped enact in creating the current crisis. Nobody's allowed to force their way into my country. Nobody's allowed to do this and still say that our humanitarian programs have, 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 uh, have, have integrity. The American people have been more than generous in the last 40 years. The American people can take a, a backseat to no one in our, our willingness to resettle people from other countries, to take in newcomers. We have been incredibly generous. In fact, very few countries in the history of the world have undergone the kind of demographic change we have, and yet Americans have been on balance, very tolerant and accepting of that change, and that's a good thing. But by the same token, if our humanitarian impulses it's programs reserved for people truly in need are taken advantage of by people who simply want to improve their economic prospects. Well, it puts into jeopardy the whole humanitarian principle as well as public support for these programs. Our asylum system was originally designed for people who were here legally and as a result of changed circumstances could not go home. And then in the Cold War, uh, there would be people who came from centralized dictatorships whose uh, basic claim here would give rise to a rebuttable presumption that they were eligible for asylum. It, it, we have a refugee admissions process for people through third countries. Asylum is not supposed to be for people who come traipsing through a bunch of safe countries and coming to the U.S. and then say, oh, yeah, I want to stay here. That's where I want to go. Asylum seekers don't get to pick and choose where they want to live. You have to make a claim at the first safe country. Somehow or other, this is lost on the Democrats now. They don't seem to see a problem with that. As far as they're concerned, once they get in, they should be able to stay and nobody has to go home. Do you realize what that means? It means the Democratic Party has taken the position that immigration is unlimited. Unlimited! Subject only to removal for people who are serious criminal felons if, in fact, the federal government can find them. Except that there's a wing now of the Democratic Party that wants to abolish ICE, wants to starve ICE, wants to take ICE out of commission. Not satisfied with having destroyed state and local cooperation with federal authorities. Not satisfied with having isolated federal enforcement authorities from other federal agencies like the IRS, Social Security Administration, and others, EPA. They want to defund ICE entirely and make it focus on bringing in alligators or endangered species, not on immigration controls. I mean, this is flat out their agenda. I mean, the good news is... Unlike 40 years ago, the true intention in the agenda of some of these people like AOC, we all hear about her, getting tired of her, aren't you? This is what they want. They want no borders. At least they're anti-borders. They have some quixotic idea that the nation state is a bad thing. 
At FAIR, we defend the nation state. We defend the proposition that nation states are the way in which civilization advances, the way in which resources are marshaled and husbanded, if you will, to bring to leverage advances throughout the world. The abolishment of the nation state is a threat to civilization itself. And everybody who believes in self-determination and true democracy as it's practiced in the modern world knows that nation states must be preserved. Keeping asylum seekers in Mexico is extraordinarily important, but not surprisingly, the ACLU has already decided to sue. I mean, in fact, there's really nothing the ACLU has not decided to sue on. It's quite remarkable because the ACLU laid out their entire litigation agenda at the beginning of the Trump administration, and they have been true to their word. They are not interested in protecting the civil liberties of people who obey the law. They are interested in trying to ensure that people who break the law never have to leave. Very simple. And if you support the ACLU, I understand why you may for other reasons, but their immigration policy positions don't cut it. TPS for Venezuela is under consideration. Now, I think we can all understand why in a perfect world TPS might make sense for Venezuela. Place is obviously in, in crisis. But wouldn't it be great if the American people could have restored a sense of confidence that temporary protected status means temporary protected status once more? To grant TPS to any new group when it's now clear that the federal government lacks the ability to, to ever terminate the status creates a crisis of confidence among the American people. In fact, one of the things that's really happened in the last 18 months is there's been an enormous increase in public understanding about what's happening and why. I remember in 1990, working on the 1990 bill when TPS was created, we, brought, we, we worked very hard at FAIR to bring attention to the things in the 1990 bill that were bad, and there were a lot of bad things. The H-1B program was created in the 1990 bill. Problem was that after the 1986 bill, the media didn't want to cover immigration. At a time of strong economic growth in 1990, people didn't see the recession coming in 1991. It passed in a lame duck session without a lot of debate. And TPS was supposed to be a one-time 18-month with an occasional extension until the host country could restore communications, food, and essential services. And it's turned into a rolling amnesty program. And I'm sure you and I could agree that that's not the intention. What this points out is that programs that were originally designed for a specific humanitarian purpose, they lose their efficacy if the people who benefited from those programs refuse to go back home when it's time to do so. They have a civic obligation, an obligation to the American people to adhere to the standards of the humanitarian grant and not turn around and say, or employers to say, well, it's inconvenient if I have to hire someone else. Self-interest an ideology is a powerful elixir. We see this on the other side all the time. They would sacrifice the core principles of humanitarian assistance to the greatest number and the altar of special interest preferences for the benefit of the few. And that's part of why we're here. Obviously, we were disappointed in the deal. The deal that the president signed a few weeks ago was a, was a bad deal. We opposed it. We don't think that the wall funding is what it needs to be, and obviously he didn't either because he declared an emergency, but he still signed the bill. You think he should have shut down the, the, the government a second time. <clears throat> it gave business, why is this in here? Why is it in here at all? An increase in H-2B workers, these are unskilled workers. Why, uh, maybe 200,000 a year. Why do we need these? Why does the president want to allow other Republicans to undercut the signal achievement of his administration, which would be in the form of higher wages and employers working hard to recruit American workers. It has other provisions, too, that essentially protect the process of smuggling alien children into the country and then reuniting them with relatives by making knowledge of the fact that their relatives are here illegally uh, a basis for never deporting them. I mean, this was some guarantee put into the law at the last minute behind closed doors. This, this process of facilitating alien smuggling at our expense, we're paying for this. Taxpayers are paying for alien smuggling now in this country. We see sex trafficking. We see what's going on in these massage parlors in Florida, courtesy of Robert Kraft. We see labor abuses all across the country, renewal of indentured servitude. So much about immigration policy is about greed and exploitation. We hear nothing but the humanitarian components of it. It is about Greed and exploitation, guest workers, bringing in subordinated labor, illegal labor, 
operates not much differently than those who defended the slave system. It is about employing people who lack the leverage to be able to defend their rights. The, this greed agenda masquerade, masquerades as a humanitarian agenda. And those people who continue to defend this trafficking operation need to be held accountable for what they've done. You may have missed it, but FAIR put out a major new report a few weeks ago that uh, took advantage of, uh, uh, actually we tried to finally sh shred the shibboleth. You hear it over and over again. They keep saying over and over again. Illegal aliens don't commit crimes as frequently as American citizens. This offensive and ridiculous stereotype has been put to bed once and for all by this excellent new report from our research department here at FAIR, which went and analyzed the SCAP data, that's the State Criminal Alien Assistance Program data, to take a look at the reimbursement requests that states were making to the federal government for their illegal alien incarcerated population. Doing some quick math, we back-ended it out to figure out the percentage that were here illegally. And lo and behold, what we found is, in fact, that's not true. In fact, you know what? If you're here illegally, you really can't not break the law. It's not just entering without inspection or entering fraudulently or using phony documents or failure to file taxes or a variety of other things. I mean, you simply have to break the law if you're here illegally on a fairly routine basis. Not possible not to. Crimes of moral turpitude, fraud, phony documents. I mean, you just plain have to. How can it possibly be that people who don't respect our laws don't commit crimes more frequently than people who do? If you have not seen this report, it's on our website. I encourage you to take a look at it. So as you can see, there's a lot going on right now. Part of our success in 2016, seeing the administration take immigration front and center and adopt a whole lot of core principles that have been part of the marquee agenda of this organization for going on the last 30, 40 years, has been enormously gratifying. But I am here to advise you. It's not just that we have a divided Congress and, quote, not much is going to get done. It doesn't work that way. Things will get done in the next two years. The question is, are they going to be good or bad? We can get some good things done through some must-pass legislation attaching things in the House or Senate. But the real problem is that the pushback as a result of the success of the Trump administration is now coming directly from business groups that are pushing very hard on the Republican side. People like Tom Tillis from North Carolina, who turned around and were voting against the administration's emergency declaration. These guys are totally in the pockets of these cheap labor interests. Probably one of the most frustrating things to me in 40 years is the media pay all attention, all this attention to loud people like AOC, these loud vocal people, Kristen Gillibrand and these other people running for president. They, they're, they're, they're noisy. You know, Bernie Sanders is press secretary. Noisy, noisy, noisy. But that's not where the power really lies. The power really lies in big agriculture, okay? Manufacturers, contractors, associations. Big agriculture is huge. They're the ones who've been calling the tunes, who have been really working to torpedo the much-needed immigration controls for the last 40 years. Clearly, the Democrats, as a party now, see an opportunity. Without mass immigration, their prospects for winning the White House have been pretty bleak. Mass immigration represents the only major opportunity for the Democrats to consolidate political control for the next 50 years. And as a result, we're, we're operating within a system which is unfortunately not working in the best interest of the, of the American people overall. You need a voice here in Washington. You need a voice like FAIR. FAIR will be there, hopefully for the next 40 years. Now, I remember way back, some of the folks here said, yeah, you know what, we're going to get this thing done in 10 years and we're going to close our doors and nothing would make me happy. You know, I'm probably retiring in five or six, maybe eight years. I hope I get to retire. Nobody here says I can retire, but I think retirement might come sometime. I do hope we can all, you know, all say, you know what, we got the job done. Part of the reason immigration is out of control now is because people who actually succeeded in holding the line in 1952, the Karen Walter Act, Closed their doors and went away. Immigration was very low until 1968 or 9. So the 65 Act passed in part because people turned their backs on the issue, didn't pay attention. It had been low for a long time, not viewed as a big issue. Nobody really knew what they were doing when they drafted the 65 Act. It was just something done on the back of a cocktail napkin. 
We can never allow that to happen again. We cannot allow that to happen again. No nation has faced the kind of global demographic pressures on its border as the United States, parts of Europe, and others face today. We represent the cultural enlightenment that makes us a destination that everybody wants to come here to enjoy. Why we should be tearing each other apart and scratching each other's, other's eyeballs out at a time when so much of the world wants to move here is simply beyond me, but maybe we're just doing so well. We don't have anything else to do but holler at each other. But we have so much to be proud of. But in order to preserve the things that we care most about, we have to ensure that our borders are controlled and the immigration levels are kept under proper controls and limits. Immigration is simply too high. Without fair, without fair in a couple of our allies, you will not see the kind of voice this nation needs uh, over the next decades to defend uh, this con- against this constant attack on our, on our future integrity, our immigration controls, our ability to decide our future. Your children and grandchildren depend upon this. So I appreciate you being part of our fair family, supporting what the organization does. All of us are proud to be associated with the organization. It's always difficult to tell the truth, not always easy to tell the truth, because people out there don't want us to tell the truth. But thanks to your coming here, visiting with us periodically, every day 24-7 on our Twitter feed, our Facebook feed, ably handled by our expert staff, you get the truth. Truth is what you'll get today. Truth is what you'll get tomorrow. So thank you for being part of FAIR, and I will talk to you again soon.